our United States of America. What have we done? Through our arrogance, laziness, greed, and corruption, we have allowed our government that our founding forefathers gave us, a conservative republic, to fall into a democracy filled with socialism, Marxism, and we're heading towards a North American Union and world power with a global currency. It's an oligarchy form of government ruled by the powerful and the elite. We, the people, will become slaves with a barcode on our foreheads, just a piece of meat with a wallet. Socialism only works in two places, heaven where they don't need it, and hell where they already have it. Ronald Reagan. How do you conquer a nation who has the greatest military superiority that the world has ever seen? You don't. You wait and watch it crumble from within and we are crumbling at an enormous rate. If the United States of America dies, there will be no one to protect freedom or the weak. America will never be destroyed from the outside. If we falter and lose our freedoms, it will be because we destroyed ourselves. Abraham Lincoln. We are in the beginning of the end of the United States and our freedom is at stake. Let's always remember that it's not you the government, it's we the people, and we the people must take our government back in 2012, or the damage that will be done will be irreversible. I predict future happiness for Americans if they can prevent the government from wasting the labors of the people under the pretense of taking care of them. Thomas Jefferson. The threats to our nation are greater than ever from unemployment, parts of corporate America, illegal aliens, Islam, and both political parties of our own government. All through recorded history, no country has ever stayed in power with a bankrupt economy or as a country that is unemployed. Let's go over the threats to our nation and the good news of our only way out. You judge for yourself. Our economy is in a crisis. People are suffering, losing everything they've worked for their whole life. Our government says that bold action is required, so we're jumping in head first to get things back on track. But what exactly are we jumping into? Many felt it started in September of 2008 with a $29.5 billion bailout of Bear Stearns. And even after you adjust for inflation, it's much more than other huge projects from our history like the Hoover Dam or the Panama Canal. But that still wasn't enough. So we committed another $97.2 billion to Bank of America, $97.4 billion for auto companies, and $112 billion for AIG. That's almost the same of $115 billion we spent to rebuild Europe after World War II. Add in another $139 billion for GE and $235 billion for Citigroup, that's $710 billion to bail out banks and big corporations. But that's just a start. We're paying another $300 billion for homeowners who can't pay their mortgages. This is slightly less than the cost of World War I, but not as much as the $400 billion that we're spending to prop up Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. These numbers are simply huge. On their own, any one of these programs would rate among the largest in U.S. history, falling behind record holders like the New Deal or the Iraq War. But add in the additional $700 billion that we're spending to buy up bad loans through TARP and a $787 billion stimulus package. In total, the government has spent over $4 trillion on this crisis, and it beats the all-time record holder, World War II. Unfortunately, these $4 trillion is not the beginning. Since 1789, when our federal government was created, there have been times when we've had a balanced budget, but we have never had zero as our national debt. We have had our ups and downs through the years with peaks from the War of 1812, Civil War, World War I, and the highest peak of national debt until recent years was World War II. Then, in the 1980s, our national debt started to grow quickly. In 1981, our national debt was $998 billion, and over 20 years later in 2001, our national debt grew to $5.8 trillion. That's an enormous amount of money, but it's nothing compared to what's next. In 2009, our national debt was $10 trillion. In just eight years, our debt grew another $4.2 trillion. Now, at the end of 2010, our national debt is $14 trillion. And with the government committing to spend an additional $7.8 trillion over the next few years, 
And let's not forget we owe Social Security $2.5 trillion, along with $26 billion a year in foreign aid. We are going into debt at a rate of $3.5 billion a day. Depending on who you believe or what website you've seen, somewhere between two and five trillion dollars have been given out without Congress or us being told where it is gone. We do know this, there is no doubt that there is money missing. We've heard that from members of Congress. So if we add everything up, it could be $24 trillion or more by the year 2012. Divide $24 trillion of debt by 305 million Americans. That would be $78,000 of debt for every man, woman, and child in the United States. Make no mistake, both political parties are responsible for this life-threatening, freedom-taking disaster. This national debt could at any time put an end to the United States of America. This crisis was avoidable and an easy fix. Let's take a 10-story building as an illustration. As you're looking at this building, you notice that there's a crack in the foundation. Each and every day this crack gets bigger and bigger. The crack is so large now that the integrity of the building is now at stake. So if you're gonna fix the building, would you start at the top and work your way down? That's what the government is doing now. Or would you start at the foundation and work your way up? The building represents the United States and the foundation represents we, the people. We are the foundation to our country, and if you would fix us first by putting us back to work on nationwide jobs, we the people would have kept paying our bills, and we wouldn't have to lose everything we've worked for our entire life. For corporate America, they need to take their own financial hits and learn a lesson on greed. In 1907, the collapse of Wall Street was caused by derivatives. Derivatives are side bets on anything that's established, such as commodity, security, or credit default swaps of today. And that all took place in what they called bucket shops, which looked a lot like betting parlors. Derivatives were outlawed in 1909, but were brought back in 2000 with the help of Alan Greenspan. Congress passed a law prohibiting states to ban or regulate financial derivatives, and of course, Bill Clinton signed it into law. It's estimated that there's over $400 trillion of side bets on derivatives worldwide, and our banks account for $280 trillion of that. Now you understand why they don't care about lending money or making loans or even keeping us in our homes. There are many who are responsible for this financial disaster, but the banks are at the top of the list. Banks today would rather gamble on the roll of a dice, a turn of a card, or a pull of a lever instead of hard work, safe investments, or commitment to customer care. I believe that banking institutions are more dangerous to our liberties than standing armies. If the American people ever allow private banks to control the issue of their currency, first by inflation, then by deflation, the banks and corporations that will grow up around the banks will deprive the people of all property until their children wake up homeless on the continent their fathers conquered. Thomas Jefferson. If you're for open borders, a North American Union, or a world power with global currency, then this is going perfectly to your plans. But for we the people, we have a way out, and it's already in the works. You'll hear us loud and clear in 2012 when we the people take back our land and our government. For all of you who are responsible for the undermining and destruction of our country, you are guilty of treason and you should be held accountable. A great nation cannot remain great if it cannot keep its economy strong. We the people. Politicians and government. Have you ever wondered where are today's George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Andrew Jackson, John Adams, and Benjamin Franklin? Those in our government in the beginning of our country were doctors, lawyers, farmers, teachers, merchants, inventors, scientists, soldiers, generals, and yes, ministers. In fact, 29 out of 56 of our signers of the Declaration of Independence had seminary or Bible school degrees. They were devoted to hard work, without self-greed, love for God and for country. And when you looked at their occupation, it didn't say politician. To them, it was an honor to protect and serve the people of the United States of America. Today, those in government think it's a career instead of duty, 
honor, or a privilege to serve we the people. They all have their hands in places they don't belong. 95% of elected officials haven't managed a company, owned a business, or had to make payroll. Once they get into office, they vote for themselves the best health care, salaries, retirement, with all the perks and benefits, while they advertise their services to the highest bidder. Let there be no doubt that our elected officials in city, state, and country are filled with corruption. There is no one in government or politics today that is capable of restoring our country. Few men have virtue to withstand the highest bidder. George Washington. If we're going to fix banking, Wall Street, Social Security, health care, secure our borders, put 30 million unemployed Americans back to work, and restore our country, we must raise one of our own from among we the people. We cannot survive the coming years with stimulus packages that are filled with 8,500 earmarks, paybacks to those who have lobbied and paid for the services of our elected officials. We need to put term limits on government and with no retirement or benefits. Remember, it's an honor to serve your country. It's not a lifetime retirement plan. It has been said that politics is the second oldest profession. I have learned that it bears a striking resemblance to the first. Ronald Reagan. We want it to be the law of the land that Congress cannot make any law that applies to citizens of the United States that does not apply equally to the senators or representatives or vice versa. We want it to be against the law for anyone to advertise false or misleading information on all issues we vote on and candidates we vote for. All issues we vote on to be completely separate and with no fine print where everyone knows and understands what they are voting on. Honesty is the first chapter in the Book of Wisdom. Thomas Jefferson. We want it to be against the law for any elected official in city, state, or country to accept any gifts, perks, or any kind of relationships with lobbyists from banking, Wall Street, corporate America, or any special interest groups. The penalty for committing this crime will be three times what the law allows if convicted. In return, we're offering a much better wage for our elected officials. By doing this, it will help end corruption and most importantly, attract a better qualified person to be in our government. The people are the government, administering it by their agents. They are the government, the sovereign power. Andrew Jackson. We want every division of government to have a complete itemized audit that is transparent so that we the people can see who and what we are paying for. One thing is for sure, you, the government, are not losing your job, house, car, retirement, investment, or having trouble putting food on your table. Our nation is in the greatest crisis we have ever seen, and we haven't even hit bottom yet. We've had over 235 years to get it right, and we have nothing to show for great leadership or our voting ability. If you ask for something for nothing, that means that someone else has already broken a sweat to pay for it. You must be willing to earn what you want in life and not ask what the government will give you. You reap what you sow. A government that is strong enough to give you what you want is also strong enough to take everything you have. When the government fears the people, there is liberty. But when the people fear the government, there is tyranny. Thomas Jefferson. We must come together as Americans and rely on ourselves to restore our government and our country. It is our constitutional right to have a republic as our form of government under the fourth article, fourth section. And I quote, the United States shall guarantee to every state in the union a republican form of government. We have stood strong for too long to stand for this and it's in our hands to take back our land. We must educate our youth on the true meaning of the Pledge of Allegiance and our U.S. form of government. And this is a great reminder for all of us. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. I give an oath of loyalty to the symbol that stands for all 50 states of America. And to the republic for which it stands our form of government given to us by our founding forefathers. One nation under God. The dedication of our nation and people to the Almighty.
in the visible. A country that cannot be divided. With liberty. Having the right to act according to our own free will. And justice for all. To be fair or just. And that is promised to us by the law of the land for every man, woman, and child. What exactly is our form of government? And how did we get it? When Benjamin Franklin exited the Constitutional Convention, he was asked by a woman, Sir, what have you given us? His immediate response was a Republic man, if you can keep it. Yet most Americans today have been persuaded that our nation's governmental system is a democracy and not a republic. The difference between these two is essential in understanding Americanism and the American system. Before we discuss political systems, however, it's helpful to address the confusion that has been spread about the political spectrum. Many have been led to believe that the political spectrum places groups such as communists on the far left, fascists or dictators on the far right, and political moderates or centrists in the middle. However, a more accurate political spectrum will show government having zero power on the far right to having 100% power on the far left. At the extreme right, there is no government. The extreme left features total government under such labels as communism, socialism, Nazism, fascism, princes, potentates, dictators, kings, any form of total government. Those who claim that Nazis and fascists are right-wing never define their terms. This amounts to spreading confusion. Towards the middle of the political spectrum can be found a type of government limited to its proper role of protecting the rights of the people. That's where the Constitution of the United States is. Those who advocate such a form of government are really constitutional moderates. So let's analyze the basic forms of government. They are monarchy or dictatorship, rule by one. Oligarchy, rule by a few. Democracy, rule by a majority. Republic, rule by law. And anarchy, which is rule by no one. In discussing these five, you'll see that they can be narrowed down to even fewer. Looking first at monarchy or dictatorship, this form of government doesn't really exist in the practical sense. It's always a group that puts one of its members up front. A king has his council of nobles or earls, and every dictator has his bureaucrats or commissars, the men behind the scenes. This isn't rule by one, even though one person may be the visible leader. It's rule by a group. So let's eliminate monarchy, dictatorship, because it never really exists. Oligarchy, which is ruled by a group, is the most common form of government in all history, and it's the most common form of government today. Most of the nations of the world are ruled by a powerful few, and therefore oligarchy remains. At the other end, we find anarchy, which means without government. Some people have looked over history and found that many of its worst crimes were committed by governments, so they decided that having no government might be a good idea. But this was a mistake, because as the ancient Greeks stated, without law, there can be no freedom. Our founding fathers agreed and held that some amount of government is a necessary force in any civilized, orderly society. In the state of anarchy, however, everyone has to guard life, liberty, and property and the lives of family members. Everyone must be armed and movement is severely restricted because one's property has to be protected at all times. Civilized people have always hired people to do the gardening, the sheriff, the police force, or some branch of government. Once law enforcement was in place, the people were freer. They could leave their property, work in the fields, and so on. In short, the proper amount of government makes everyone freer. There are some who advocate anarchy, however, not because they want no government, but because they don't like what they have. They use anarchy as a tool for revolutionary change. The condition of anarchy is very much like a vacuum where something rushes in to fill it. These calculating anarchists work to break down the existing government with rioting, killing, looting, and terrorism. Tragically, the people living in such chaos often go to the best available to put an end to it and beg them to take over and restore order. And who is best able to put an end to the chaos? 
The very people who started it. The anarchists who created the problem then create a government run by them. An oligarchy, where they have total power. This is exactly what happened in Russia that led to Lenin taking total power. And in Germany, where Hitler's brown shirts created the chaos that brought him to power. But anarchy isn't a stable form of government. It's a quick transition from something that exists to something desired by the power-hungry. It's a temporary condition. And because it isn't permanent, we eliminate it as well. The word democracy comes from two Greek words, demos, meaning people, and kratian, meaning to rule. Democracy, therefore, means the rule of the people, majority rule. This, of course, sounds good, but suppose the majority decides to take away one's home, business, or children. Obviously, there has to be a limit. The flaw in democracy is that the majority isn't restrained. If more than half the people can be persuaded to want something in a democracy, they rule. What about republic? Well, that comes from the Latin word res, meaning thing, and publica, meaning public. It means the public thing, the law. A true republic is where the government is limited by law, leaving the people alone. America's founders had a clean slate to write on. They could have set up an oligarchy. In fact, there were some who wanted George Washington to be their king. But the Founding Fathers knew history, and they chose to give us the rule of law in a republic and not the rule of the majority in a democracy. Why? Let's demonstrate the difference in the setting of the Old West. Consider a lynch mob in a democracy. 35 horseback riders chase one lone gunman. They catch him, and they vote 35 to 1 to hang him. Democracy has triumphed, and there's one less gunman to contend with. Now, consider the same scenario in a republic. The 35 horseback riders catch the gunman and vote 35 to 1 to hang him. But the sheriff arrives, and he says, you can't kill him. He's got his right to a fair trial. So they take the gunman back to town, a jury of his peers is selected, and they hear the evidence and the defense, and they decide that he shall hang. Does the jury even decide by majority rule? No, it has to be unanimous or he goes free. The rights of the government aren't subject to majority rule, but to the law. This is the essence of a republic. Many Americans would be surprised to learn that the word democracy does not appear in the Declaration of Independence or the U.S. Constitution, nor does it appear in any of the constitutions of the 50 states. The founders did everything they could to keep us from having a democracy. James Madison, rightly known as the father of the Constitution, wrote in essay number 10 of the Federalist Papers, Democracies have ever been spectacles of turbulence and contention, have ever been found incompatible with personal security or the rights of property, and have in general been as short in their lives as they have been violent in their death. Alexander Hamilton agreed, and he stated, We are a Republican government. Real liberty is never found in despotism or in the extremes of democracy. Samuel Adams, a signer of the Declaration of Independence, stated, Democracy never lasts long. It soon wastes, exhausts, and murders itself. The founders had good reason to look upon democracy with contempt because they knew that the democracies in the early Greek city-states produced some of the wildest excesses of government imaginable. In every case, they ended up with mob rule, then anarchy, and finally tyranny under an oligarchy. During that period in Greece, there was a man named Solon who urged creation of a fixed body of law not subject to majority whims. Where the Greeks never adopted Solon's wise counsel, the Romans did. Based on what they knew of Solon's laws, they created the 12 tables of the Roman law and in effect built a republic that limited government power and left the people alone. Since government was limited, the people were free to produce with the understanding that they could keep the fruits of their labor. In time, Rome became wealthy and the envy of the world. In the midst of plenty, however, the Roman people forgot what freedom entailed. They forgot that the essence of freedom is the proper limitation of government. When government power grows, people's freedom recedes. 
Once the Romans dropped their guard, power-seeking politicians began to exceed the powers granted them in the Roman Constitution. Some learned that they could elect politicians who would use government power to take property from some and give it to others. Agriculture subsidies were introduced, followed by housing and welfare programs. Inevitably, taxes rose and the controls over the private sector were imposed. Soon, a number of Rome's producers could no longer make ends meet, and they went on the dole. Productivity declined, shortages developed, and mobs began roaming the streets demanding bread and circuses from the government. Many were induced to trade freedom for security. Eventually, the whole system came crashing down. They went from a republic to a democracy and ended up with an oligarchy under the progression of the Caesars. Thus, democracy itself is not a stable form of government. Instead, it's the gradual transition from the limited government to the unlimited rule of an oligarchy. Knowing this, we as Americans are ultimately left with only two choices. We can keep our republic, as Franklin put it, or we will inevitably end up with an oligarchy, a tyranny of the elite. Securing our borders. The United States should have prioritized border security in 1986 when Ronald Reagan made the mistake of granting amnesty to over three million law-breaking illegal aliens. Granting amnesty to anyone who breaks our laws is sending the wrong message. That three million has multiplied into 25 million plus over the last 24 years. Now we have tens of millions of illegal aliens in our country that are demanding amnesty and immigration reform. Even the word immigration is being misused. Immigration is the introduction of new people into a population. What we're experiencing in the U.S. today is a migration, which is a physical movement by humans from one area to another. Our government has released varying estimates as to the extent of illegal aliens in the U.S. today, from 12 million to 25 million. What is the true number? Well, the truth is we really don't know, and we don't have any accurate records. So let's do some simple math to arrive at an estimate based on what we do know. The government and the U.S. Border Patrol have agreed that for every illegal that we catch, 10 make it through. Just in the Tucson sector of Arizona, they arrest 250,000 illegals a year. It's one million a year in the entire United States. Therefore, if we catch one million a year, that would mean 10 million a year make it through. If we go back just the last five years and multiply that by 10 million illegal aliens a year that make it through, that would be 50 million illegal aliens are in our country. Now, think of the number of how many of them have had children since they've been here. It's safe to say that there could be as many as 50 to 70 million illegal aliens with children in our country, and that would account for 20% of our country's population. After seeing these kinds of numbers, the words immigration or migration seem very weak. The word invasion seems more appropriate. Here's a breakdown of what it costs the taxpayers to have illegal aliens in our country. $22 billion is spent on welfare to illegal aliens each year by state governments. $2.2 billion a year is spent on food assistance programs such as food stamps, WIC, and free school lunches for illegal aliens. $2.5 billion a year is spent for Medicaid for illegal aliens. $12 billion a year is spent on primary and secondary school education for children here illegally and they cannot speak a word of English. $17 billion a year is spent for education for the American-born children of illegal aliens, known as anchor babies. $3 million a day is spent to incarcerate illegal aliens. 30% of all federal prison inmates are illegal aliens. The illegal aliens in the United States have a crime rate that's two and a half times that of white non-illegal aliens. In particular, their children are going to make a huge additional crime problem in the U.S. Ninety billion dollars a year is spent on illegal aliens for welfare and social services by the American taxpayers. Two hundred billion dollars a year in suppressed American wages are caused by illegal aliens. The National Policy Institute estimated that the total cost of mass deportation would be $230 billion over a five-year period. In 2006, illegal aliens sent home $45 billion in remittances to their countries of origin. 
The total cost of illegal aliens in the United States is a whopping $340 billion a year. Times that, by the past six years, it would be over $2 trillion. Mexico's drug cartel has a $120 billion a year business. They're established in over 270 cities, and guess who their best customers are? Millions of pounds of drugs, cocaine, meth, heroin, and marijuana crossed into the U.S. We have law enforcement and border patrol agents who are on the payroll of the Mexican drug cartel. Over 100,000 illegal gang members in 33 states. Go to any public school in the United States and you'll see who is responsible for the new baby boom. It's not Americans. Our children are harassed and threatened by illegals that form gangs and outnumber our kids at school. Nine years after 9-11-2001, the terrorist threat is still among us. We have congressional reports on border threats that were kept from us until the news media broke the story. We have over 100,000 illegal aliens in our country from Middle Eastern terrorist countries. We have thousands in custody. Terrorists from Afghanistan, Egypt, Iran, Iraq, Sudan, Pakistan, Yemen, and members of Hezbollah. Yes, they have a name for them. They are called OTM, other than Mexicans. Middle Eastern terrorists will migrate to Europe, then to South America, to the tri-border region where they learn to speak Spanish. Then they travel to Mexico and blend in with the Mexicans who are illegally entering into the U.S. and the Mexican drug cartels are helping terrorists to smuggle weapons to be used against us. Children of illegal aliens who have been born in the United States are called anchor children who cannot be deported. Wrong. You are still your parents' responsibility and you shall return home with them. We must change the 14th Amendment of our Constitution that any non-U.S. citizen who gives birth in this country, your child is not American. Your child was only born in America. Why must we do this? Well, in as little as five to eight years, we the people becomes the minority, and we are outvoted by illegal aliens who broke our laws, gave birth, and have completely drained all our resources. If we lose our power in voting, we have lost our country to the invasion of illegal aliens without a shot being fired or one drop of blood being spilled, and we did nothing about it. If this becomes true, then we deserve to lose our country. Our own government wants to give amnesty to over 12 million illegal aliens. Anyone who is for open borders, a North American Union, or giving illegals amnesty, then you're not for the United States of America. If we do nothing about this and lose our country that was given to us as a blessing of one nation under God, then all those before us who fought and died for our freedom died for nothing. Illegal aliens, your arrogance and your demands offend us. You have raised your flag in the continent that our fathers conquered and in our land that is filled with the graves of patriots. You have taken our kindness as a weakness and you have made a grave mistake. You have awakened a great nation, and we are tired of pressing one for English or two for Spanish. Legal immigration is a part of what has made our country great. It is our constitutional right and duty to protect our land from all dangers, foreign or domestic. We the people. For many Americans, 9-11-2001 was the beginning of terrorism and the threat from the Nation of Islam, but it all started thousands of years ago. It is important to start at the beginning with Abraham and Sarah. God promised them a son, but they grew impatient, and Sarah asked Abraham to lay with her Egyptian maid, Hagar, so that she may have children through her. He did, and the son she bore him was named Ishmael, and his descendants are the Arabs of today. When Abraham was 99 years old, God appeared to him and made a covenant with Abraham. God promised them a son, and his name will be Isaac, and he will be the heir of the everlasting covenant, the chosen ones of pure blood, the Israelites, Jews of today. We know this by scripture. The battle of who is the firstborn still goes on today and will never end until Judgment Day. 
Let's move ahead about 2,000 years to around 610 AD when Muhammad, an Arab trader from Mecca, said he saw visions in the wilderness and proclaimed himself to be the prophet of Allah and the Muslim faith is born. Muhammad was a violent and vengeful man, just like bin Laden of today. For the next 1400 years, their faith, belief, and teachings are to kill and conquer Christians, Jews, and Gentiles. The killings of non-Muslims started from the beginning, and Islam has been soaked in blood ever since. They have killed, conquered, and butchered throughout the centuries. And they are the destruction of Christianity in the Middle East, Turkey, Egypt, North Africa, Europe, and now in Canada and the United States. There are now 65 Islamic nations. Islam is the greatest killer of all time. Over 270 million non-believers have died over the last 1400 years by the hands of Islamic Jihad. They have called Jihad on the United States back in November of 1979 when a group of Iranian students attacked and seized the American Embassy in Tehran. This seizure was an outright attack on American soil and has set the stage for events to follow for the next 25 years. In April of 1983, a large vehicle packed with high explosives was driven into the U.S. Embassy compound in Beirut, killing 63 people. Less than six months later, in 1983, a large truck with over 2,500 pounds of TNT smashed through the main gate of the U.S. Marine Corps headquarters in Beirut and killed 241 servicemen. Two months later, in December 1983, another truck loaded with explosives is driven into the U.S. Embassy in Kuwait. September 1984, a van was driven into the gate of the U.S embassy in Beirut. In April 1985, a bomb explodes in a restaurant frequented by U.S. soldiers in Madrid. August 1985, a car loaded with explosives is driven into the main gate of the U.S. Air Force Base at Rhine, Maine, killing 22. 59 days later, a cruise ship, the Achille Loro, is hijacked. April 1986, the bombing of TWA Flight 840, killing four. December 1988, the bombing of Pan Am Flight 103 over Lockerbie, Scotland, killing 270. January 1993, two CIA agents are shot and killed at CIA headquarters in Langley, Virginia. February 1993, a rented van packed with explosives is driven into the underground garage of the World Trade Center in New York City, killing six, and over 1,000 are injured. November 1995, a car bomb explodes at a U.S. military complex in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, killing seven servicemen and women. June 1996, a truck bomb explodes in front of the U.S. military compound in Iran, Saudi Arabia, killing 19 and injuring 500. Two U.S. embassies in Kenya and Tanzania were attacked simultaneously, killing 224. October 2000, the USS Cole was attacked by a small craft with explosives, killing 17 U.S. sailors. On September 11, 2001, when 19 hijackers took control of four commercial jet airliners and crashing two of them into the World Trade Center towers in New York City, a third one in the Pentagon in Arlington, Virginia, just outside of Washington, D.C., and the fourth crashes in a field near Shanksville, Pennsylvania, killing a total of 3,000. November 5, 2009, at Fort Hood, Texas, radical Muslim Major Hassan massacres 13 and wounded 30 others. It is impossible to be a Muslim and love the United States of America, but if you do, then you are not a true Muslim. According to research, in order for a culture to maintain itself for more than 25 years, there must be a fertility rate of 2.11 children per family. With anything less, the culture will decline. Historically, no culture has ever reversed a 1.9 fertility rate. A rate of 1.3 impossible to reverse because it would take 80 to 100 years to correct itself and there is no economic culture that can sustain itself during that time. In other words, if two sets of parents each have one child, there is half as many children as parents. And if those children have one child, then there is one quarter as many grandchildren as grandparents. If only a million babies are born in 2010, it would be hard to have two million adults enter the workforce in 2030. As the population shrinks, so does the culture. As of 2010, the fertility rate in France, 1.8, England, 1.6, Greece, 1.3, Germany, 1.3, Italy, 1.2, Spain, 1.1. Across the entire European Union of 31 countries, the fertility rate is a mere 1.4. Historical research tells us these numbers are impossible to reverse. In a matter of years, Europe as we know it will cease to exist. Yet the population of Europe is not declining. Why? Islamic immigration. Of all population growth in Europe since 1990, 90% has been Islamic immigration. France fertility rate 1.8 per family. Muslim fertility rate per family 8.1. In southern France, traditionally one of the most populated church regions in the world, there are now more mosques than churches. 
In just 37 years, France will be an Islamic Republic. In the last 30 years, the Muslim population of Great Britain rose from 82,000 to 2.5 million, a 30-fold increase. There are over 1,000 mosques, many of them former churches. In the Netherlands, 50% of all newborns are Muslim, and in only 15 years, half of the population of the Netherlands will be Muslim. In Russia, there are over 23 million Muslims. That is one out of five Russians. 40% of the entire Russian army will be Islamic in just a few short years. Currently in Belgium, 25% of the population and 50% of all newborns are Muslims. The government of Belgium has stated one-third of all European children will be born to Muslim families by 2025, just 15 years away. The German government has said that the fall of the German population can no longer be stopped. Its downward spiral is no longer reversible. It will be a Muslim state by the year 2050. There are 52 million Muslims in Europe today, and that number is expected to double in the next 20 years to 104 million. Closer to home, the numbers tell a similar story. Canada's fertility rate is 1.6, nearly a full point below what is required to sustain a culture, and Islam is the fastest growing religion. Between 2001 and 2006, Canada's population increased by 1.6 million, 1.2 million of those by Islamic immigration. In the United States, the current fertility rate of American citizens is 1.6. With the influx of Latino nations, the rate increases to 2.11 the bare minimum required to sustain a culture. In 1970, there were 100,000 Muslims in America, and today there are over 9 million. There are signs that Allah will grant victory to Islam in Europe without swords, without guns, without conquest. We don't need terrorists. We don't need homicide bombers. The 50 plus million Muslims in Europe will turn it into a Muslim continent within a few decades. Muammar al-Qaddafi. All that is missing for the nation of Islam to become a military world power is the overtaking of a nation that has industrial capabilities of producing and designing weapons of mass destruction. A nation that has an army, navy, air force, and nuclear weapons. They are less than 20 years away from having this capability. We, the United States, must take firm action towards preventing or preparing for World War III. It could be the bloodiest and the greatest loss of life of all wars combined. With our president defending the nation of Islam, bowing to a Saudi king, and appointees to our government that are Muslim tells us the true story of their plans to conquer the world. We are running out of time, and this is a worldwide call to action. For Americans, we lived in the land of the free only because of the brave. In God we trust. The world is a dangerous place, not because of those who do evil, but because of those who look on and do nothing. Albert Einstein. Our Way Out. Our good news is we have a way out. We must multitask at the greatest level. First and foremost, at the top of our list is always the health and safety of our military men and women. We must always give them the very best of what they need in battle and health care for our wounded here at home and for their life after military duties. From what we have seen and heard, this is not being done. We, the people, must take back our country in 2012 or the damage that will be done will be irreversible. Return to our roots back to the day our country was born as a conservative republic, a government that enforces the law of the land so we may enjoy the fruits of our labor. Socialism is a philosophy of failure, the creed of ignorance, and the gospel of envy. Its inherent virtue is the equal sharing of misery. Winston Churchill. Never give up our constitutional right to bear arms. The strongest reason for people to retain the right to keep and bear arms is, as a last resort, to protect themselves against tyranny in government. Thomas Jefferson. Retrieve all our money, even the money that is missing. Bring those to justice who have committed a crime against our country. And that means all the way to the White House a complete itemized audit of our government with transparency. We the people want to know who and what we are paying for. We must go to the private sector of our country for help in government reform. 
tax reform at both the state and federal level. It's filled with nothing but corruption, and if we're truthful with ourselves, it needs to be completely thrown out, and we need to start over. Bring our industries back to America. They've taken jobs away from Americans and given them to other countries for cheaper labor and greater profits. You must return home. Your nation and people need you. We need stronger new laws and regulations on banks and Wall Street. If we don't, there will be another financial meltdown. Past history has proven that. Plan and build for the future in technology, infrastructure, industry, energy, education, health care, retirement, and with our children, for they are the future. A child miseducated is a child lost. John F. Kennedy. Put 30 million unemployed Americans back to work. Infrastructure is the quickest way to stimulate our construction trades, since housing and commercial construction is a thing of the past for at least the next 10 years. We all should know by now that the buying and selling of homes, the construction of residential and commercial properties, the manufacturing of products for construction, and the process of lending money for housing and construction projects is a huge part of our economy. Without a true stimulus package for construction, there will be no quick recovery of this recession. All of the nationwide jobs that we're going to share with you either save or make us money. Our first nationwide project is infrastructure. We have not maintained or improved our infrastructure on a nationwide level. On our network of roads, highways, bridges, railways, water supply and resources, wastewater treatment plants, gas and electric delivery systems, hazardous waste and recycling, we have fallen years behind. In the past 30 years, we have had 25 bridges collapse, and most of the bridges in the U.S. were built with a 50-year lifespan. That has come due. The recently completed Hoover Dam Bypass Bridge is a great example of architectural design and technology with a willingness to improve. Worldwide construction jobs are being built today. From Russia's Sakhalin oil and gas drilling in the North Pacific, the Nord Stream gas pipeline and underground gas storage in the Netherlands, $50 billion of new construction in Abu Dhabi, the skyscrapers and hotels of Dubai, Peru's dam tunnel, the expansion of the Panama Canal, the Hong Kong Bridge, China's $62 billion water transfer project and the $24 billion Three Gorges Dam, Singapore's Sky Park and Deep Sewage Station, and the list goes on. It seems like all we're building are casinos and ballpark stadiums, and on both of them, we lose money the moment we walk in. What is it costing us for the unemployment of 17% or 30 million unemployed Americans? We have an overabundance of work and infrastructure in every city of the United States, and a workforce that is ready to go to work. We've spent trillions of dollars on stimulus packages and bailouts that have done nothing to put 30 million unemployed Americans back to work. Infrastructure throughout the nation would create over 2 million new jobs. Putting Americans back to work means we have Americans spending money, and that would stimulate the return of small businesses, and that means more jobs. America is not built on fear. America was built on courage, on imagination, and an unbeatable determination to do the job at hand. Harry S. Truman. The second nationwide project is recycling. Our plan for recycling is for a federal law mandating the elimination of all landfills. This includes burying any and all trash commercially or residentially. We have to recycle everything we make or import. Across the United States, it will take 10,000 new facilities to recycle everything we throw away. We need to be the world's leader and example of recycling. It is estimated that we have 400 million tons of waste and only 30% is recycled. There is 1 billion tons of waste worldwide. 20% of the world's plastic ends up in our oceans. We're now finding plastic in our food supply of fish. We all know we should have done this 20 years ago. We want it to be mandatory, so it will force us to act quickly. Let's find the best recycling plant we have, update it, leave room for expansion, and get to building. 
our recycling plan would create over one million new jobs. Our third nationwide project is securing our borders. This is not about offending our neighbors to the north or south or Americans who are Hispanic. This is about legal U.S. citizens defending and protecting their country from the invasion of illegal law-breaking people. It's not profiling or discrimination. It's about securing our nation and the welfare of our people. We have roughly 2,000 miles to the south, with about 1,000 miles of vehicle and pedestrian fencing done. The fence that is being built is a perfect example of those in government approving a project without any foresight, without architectural design, engineering, advice from experts, and the mental capability of knowing what will or will not work. The fence we are building right now doesn't work. Illegals cut holes in the fence or throw ropes with hooks and climb over. We need new federal laws prohibiting the hiring of illegal aliens with stiff penalties for all lawbreakers. We have to make the risk not worth the reward, or new laws will not work. No matter what laws we pass and enforce, it will not stop terrorists. We are the number one target for terrorists, and it's time to build a wall. Our plan is to build a 12-foot high, 2-foot thick concrete security wall. It will have razor security wire on top, cameras, motion sensors, ground sensors, and every mile will have solar lighting. Our wall will have all the latest technology along with unmanned aerial drones. The wall must be built to last centuries and accent our landscape as best as possible. For the Border Patrol to do their job properly and efficiently, we will need a two-lane road the length of our southern border. The construction cost for the building of the wall will be less than the cost of the illegal aliens in our country per year. That means over a six-year period, we would save over two trillion dollars. Our fourth nationwide project is the end of the mining and burning of coal. Now, we're not for the taking of jobs, but the truth needs to be told. The mining and burning of coal is not only a threat to our nation, but also a threat to the whole world. In our states of Kentucky, Tennessee, Virginia, and West Virginia, mountaintop removal and valley fill coal mining are the same as strip mining on steroids. Over 1.4 million acres have been mined. That is more landmass than the state of Delaware. The forests are cleared. High explosives blast up to 800 feet of mountaintop. Heavy equipment moves the soil to adjacent valleys. Giant dragline machinery extracts the coal and off to processing it goes. The Environmental Protection Agency has estimated that over 2,200 square miles of Appalachian forests have been cleared and valley fills have buried over 800 miles of Appalachian streams. Coal companies are supposed to reclaim land, but all too often mine sites are left stripped and bare. The valleys that were filled in block the natural flow of fresh water streams. Even where attempts to replant vegetation have been made, the mountain is never again returned to its healthy state. The aftermath of the process of washing coal results in thousands of gallons of contaminated water that looks like black sludge or slurry. This sludge is often stored behind earth dams the size of ponds or small lakes. Often this black sludge gets into the natural water and contaminates all water supplies going downstream. It's an environmental disaster from start to finish and has no place in the future of the United States. The industries that take part in the burning of coal in the United States and the world are the undisputed champions of pollution worldwide, and there is nothing that compares. By 2012, there will be 7,500 coal-fired power plants in 79 countries, pumping out 9 billion tons of CO2 emissions annually. The top 15 nations account for 75% of the world's CO2 emissions. So we know what causes CO2 emissions, and we know where it's coming from, but we're unwilling to fix it. We are killing the world we live in, and those in charge of industries and government are blinded by power, corruption, and money. Their wallets are more important than the air we breathe. We must convert all coal-burning industries over to natural gas. It burns much cleaner, and there's plenty of it. We all know there's much more we need to do for our environment, and we must have the desire and the eagerness to correct the wrong we all have done.
We must restore and preserve the world we live in. It's the only one we have. We the people. Our fifth nationwide job is energy. Are we going to be a nation that depends on a power grid of electricity that is supplied by coal, nuclear power, solar farms, or millions of wind turbines? We have great resources in our country, and it's time we put them to use. Our plan is for the use of hydroelectric power on a nationwide scale. This construction project will be the greatest achievement known to man and will take over 40 years to complete. We will need the participation of other countries and their skilled workforce to help us to dig and bore over 2,400 miles of underground tunnels. Both Lake Superior and Lake Michigan are almost the size of the state of Florida. That is an enormous amount of fresh water. Our plan is to bore a tunnel from Lake Michigan to Lake Powell and then back to Lake Michigan. This tunnel will have a diameter of 70 feet or more. It could have 12 or more 6-foot diameter steel water pipes, each having hydroelectric turbines every 25 to 50 miles. That is 100 times the electrical output of all the power plants in the state of California. All underground tunnels have problems with groundwater, but for this project, we want groundwater. 1,200 miles of tunnels gathering groundwater and pumping it to Lake Powell will help our western states with their water shortage. We want green, and you can't get any greener than hydroelectric power. Our electric energy plan will take us into the 22nd century. It would not only stimulate our economy, but the whole world. We could have over 40 years of work for the entire nation, and all of these projects either save or make us money. There would be enough jobs for everyone, and the only excuse for not having a job is laziness. Our way out of this financial disaster is to work hard, break a sweat, get paid for your labor, pay your bills, and the natural flow of money from hand to hand will restore the jobs that were lost. Take away greed and corruption, add common sense and the wisdom and knowledge to plan for the future. If the United States would lead, the world will follow. It's in our hands to restore our land. One flag, one language, one country. We the people. Let's tell the nation we have a way out. We're going to take back our country and restore her to greater heights than ever before. By the people, for the people, one nation under God. When we pledge allegiance to our flag, there is no doubt where we stand. We are American made and we have a hunger to be free. There are about 195 countries on earth, but there is only one that is strong enough and capable to stand and defend freedom. There have been only two defining forces that have ever offered to die for us. Jesus Christ who died for our sins and the American soldier who has died for our freedom. I'm Bert Kiefer, founder and writer of AmericaWorking.org. I'm a Christian American who believes in a conservative republic as our form of government. A government that enforces the laws of the land so that we may enjoy the fruits of our labor. I'm 53 years old and I have wasted 38 years of my life not being the man that I could have or should have been, but not anymore. I want to be able to say that I gave it my all and I gave it my best, and I want that for you too. That is what it's going to take from us is our very best to get us out of this mess. We all have done wrong in life, I more than most. Let's forgive, encourage each other's hearts, lift each other's spirits, build our faith, put hope and pride back into our people, and to restore our country the United States of America to greater heights than ever before. Until we meet again, thank you and God bless.